First of all, thank you, Lord, for just another day that you allowed us to be in the land of the living, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for bringing us in our right mind on today. Lord, we thank you for your, your, uh, your gracious power, your keeping power. Lord, we thank you for your healing virtues on today, Lord Jesus. Lord, we ask that you bless our services. Uh, help us, Lord Jesus, to hide the word in our hearts, Lord Jesus, that we might not sin against thee, Lord. And Lord, we ask that you touch hearts in a way it, uh, like, like no other way, Lord Jesus. And we thank you in advance for what you've done and what you're about to do, all in the matchless name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Amen. Thank you, Evangelist Tyler. We say praise the Lord to everyone. Thank you all so much for joining us today for um, worship and for Bible class. Um, I hope you are ready for work because it is sure coming. Uh, God is faithful. Um, at this time, we're going to have a scripture read by Brother Bernard Handy. Uh, praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord. Uh, I know Pastor John is uh, teaching on 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 6. And I think uh, Proverbs chapter 6 must be an Old Testament twin to it. So I'm going to read a few verses from Proverbs chapter 6, verses 16 to 23. These six things does the Lord hate. Yeah, seven are an abomination to him. A proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, and heart that devises wicked imaginations, feet that be swift in running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among brethren. My son, keep their father's commandment, and for, forsake not the law of thy mother. Bind them continually upon thine heart, and tie them about thy neck. When thou goest, it shall lead thee. When thou sleepest, it shall keep thee. And when thou wakest, it shall talk with thee. For the commandment is a lamp, and the law is light, and reproofs are instructions, and reproofs of instruction are the way of life. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. At this time, we're going to have a song under the direction of our minister of music, Sister Cynthia. Praise the Lord. Uh, I'm singing a very old hymn. Um, just been singing it all week. I'm, I don't really know the words, but I've been singing it because I just hear Dad and them singing. I just kind of knew the chorus a little bit. So I uh, pulled the words up here and hopefully I can <laughs> read and focus at the same time. Um, story, how a Savior came from glory, how he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his groaning, of his precious blood's atoning, then I repented of my sins and won the victory. Jesus, my Savior forever, who sought me and brought me up, with his redeeming blood. He loved me, I knew him, and all my love is to him. Oh, he brought me to victory, beneath the flames and flood. His healing of his kings and power revealing how he made the lame to walk and caused the blind to see. Then I cried, Dear Jesus, come and heal my broken spirit. And somehow Jesus came and brought the victory. Me to victory with his demon blood. 
Amen. Amen. Awesome. Amen. Awesome. Amen. Awesome. It makes me so much more excited to get back in church. <laughs> Hear that in person again. Thank you so much for that song. Um, at this time, I just want to remind everyone we his prayer will pick back up the following week, so not this week. And then also we have our church business meeting, I believe this Wednesday at 7 p.m. or 7.30. Not correct. Um, and uh, at this time, we will have our um, Bible study lesson by Pastor Carol. Praise the Lord, everyone. Praise the Lord. Yeah. Good to have everyone back once again. Uh, as everyone knows, we alternate um, chapters in 1 Corinthians. And so uh, this is still Pastor John's uh, chapter, chapter number six. Uh, he's not feeling well and things like that. So we're just covering and keep on going on. So I want to just pick up uh, where he left off last Sunday. Uh, and then go into the next verse uh, in chapter six. We sent the entire chapter out uh, in the Sunday school announcement this morning, uh, I guess. So I want to pick it up and keep in mind that, uh, and I kind of go back to where we started with this church of Corinth. Well, Pastor Bobby started off chapter one and somewhere along the line, uh, we just got to keep remembering uh, the audience uh, that he wrote to this church of Corinth and, uh, and if you remember that first Sunday, uh, Pastor Bobby talked about Corinth, talked about cities in the, I guess, in the world of America that were anything went, or anything goes. I can't remember exactly. But anyway, we got to some point where everyone said Las Vegas, and that was close to Corinth, I think. Um, if, if, if Las Vegas could get a little bit more um, uh, lower, I guess a little lower, <laughs> a little wilder, uh, a little bit with no, uh, no rules and no lines, they probably get very close to Corinth at that point. So we're talking to the church, the church is actually, you know, in Corinth. And so things just bleed in, things bleed out. But it's easy to get, if you think about it, it's easy for the church to get caught up in doing things. So when we read these, we got to remember that this church is surrounded by that. Yeah, just like we're surrounded by that. But just because you're surrounded by that doesn't mean that it's, it's okay now you get, you know, fade into the background or, or fade into anything else. I, I was thinking this morning about um, uh, back in 1978, the uh, PAW had the convention and the convention was in Miami, Miami, Florida, not Miami Beach, but it was on the beach in Miami. And I mean, it was Miami Beach. Anyways, <laughs> anyway, so uh, one of the problems was that uh, everything kind of just went in Miami Beach. And so uh, one night, uh, one of the speakers got up and he was he was kind of fussing a little bit about the the church people and he said and I didn't know I was in college and he said some things I didn't know what he said but he said uh, uh, you can't tell the sinners from the saints uh, out on the beach and he said uh, everyone everyone out there skinny dipping I didn't know what skinny dipping was at the time he said everybody's skinny dipping but you can't tell the sinners from the saints and he was really getting worked up and he said well last time we have a convention here in Miami Beach because when the church folks who are normally inside doors and having, you know, Hollywood time when we're in Chicago or Dallas or someplace else. And when they got down in Miami Beach, it's like, whoa, all this is going on. I could, you know, do something. But anyway, it just kind of got confusing. And so it's, it, it kind of looked like this church at Corinth. They get the inside of Corinth and things just happen with what Paul is writing his letter. says, no, it's not okay. And you, we, you need to know who you are. Y'all doing a whole lot of things. And these things that we're talking about here are all symptoms, but it gets down to the root of what the, what the real problem is. And that root problem is the one that we have to really take and apply to our lives. So a lot of times you say some things and then it comes back to something else. Uh, we talked in, uh, in chapter six, which we're gonna to get to now. He started off as Pastor John did last week, talking about lawsuits, okay? And, and well, well, he ended up uh, in verses you know, 9, 10, 11, didn't sound like lawsuits at all. It's like, I thought you were talking about lawsuits, but now you morphed into something else. Well, there's a lot of things going on. We got one thing. That's not the only thing. And many of us, we look at our lives, we're working on something. I got to stop doing this. I got to stop picking anything. I got to stop watching so much TV. Okay, great. Well, what's the real problem? The real problem is not the TV. <laughs> the real problem is something else. I don't know what the something else is. So we can't just pick out something and say, don't do that. Um, many times uh, when these... Uh, like these self-help books talk a lot about uh, 
you want to stop doing something. Let's just say I picked, uh, I watched too much TV. So, okay, I'll stop watching TV. Now, what are you going to do with that time? I don't know. Well, that means you're going to go back to watching TV. So it's like, if you're going to, you have to replace it with something else. So I'm going to stop watching TV and maybe I'll start, maybe I'll start reading more. Okay, so really it's saying I'm going to read more. So now I'm reading more, then I'm going to start watching TV. So a lot of times we pick out the sin or the thing we're trying to get out of our lives. And maybe it's not a sin. It was just something that doesn't look right for a believer. Uh, but replace it with something else noble, something grand, something uh, that's, that's praiseworthy. Uh, like we read in uh, Philippians 4, but think on these things. So always replace it with something else. So the, when we get down to the root of what the issue is in Corinth, it's, it's something that's not the exact thing we look at. So today we're going to look uh, continue on in in, in 1 Corinthians 6, taking a couple more verses from, from where <clears throat> Pastor John left off last week, and then maybe uh, he'll be back next week to finish it up when he's feeling better. So I'm going to share my screen now and uh, go from there. All right, so, so um, I like someone read verses nine and ten um, and eleven. That's where uh, Pastor John stopped last week. Uh, Pastors nine, ten, and eleven. Some read those two verses, three verses. Okay, how about somebody read eleven? I'm going to read nine and ten. Okay, so Paul was talking about lawsuits. Okay, but then he got down to this point. It says, no, you not. Now, Paul said, no, you not quite a few times here in, in 1 Corinthians 6. And when he says, no, you not, he's not really asking a question. He's saying, really, this is a rhetorical question. He says, you know this, you know better. So the, these, this church of Corinth obviously is, is forgetting or not putting into practice some things they already know. So, and we'll see it quite a bit in this chapter. So he says, no, you not. Y'all know this. The unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Now, Paul went off on that list, but, but we thought we were talking about those who were suing each other in the church. That's what we thought we were talking about. So in fact, that's not me. Uh, I know who it is. It's those two. They're the ones who's doing it. So I'm enjoying this thing while Paul checked these people in. But then Paul said, wait a minute. You, you fornicators, adulterers, adulterers, feminists, abuse of themselves, man, can y'all sitting here, thieves, covetous, drunkards, revilers, extortioners, all y'all sitting up in the two. It's like, there's a real problem here. There's so many symptoms here that, and it's not just one thing. So Paul said, look, none, none of this, is, none of you, none of those will inherit the kingdom of God. So now we look at this, it's, it's a bigger issue. It's never the, the one thing because all, all, they all have issues of some sort and they need to be dealt with. And so you don't point fingers one or the other, but the church is having issues and the church is having issues and uh, for a reason, and Paul's gonna address that. Now, Paul takes this point after he says that, which is, um, uh, I think it, it arrests the attention when they say, oh, none of you will inherit the kingdom of God. And people will find themselves, hey, I've done that. I've done this. Wait a minute. I've done this. I, I've, oh, yeah, I remember. Uh, you know, it was just like a thing to do at the time. Oh, it's the season. Oh, it's just I got caught up with the rest of these Corinthians. Yeah, all these things are happening as walked his life, but there's still no excuse for that. Paul says, look, they shall not inherit the kingdom of God, but God has given a remedy for that. You think about God is not just giving the church a pass. Yeah, I know it's the times you're in. Oh, y'all live in Corinth. I understand this. Yeah, you don't really know better. No, God doesn't just get past his life. He doesn't just wink at things like that because he sent his son to die on the cross for that, for all those sins. Even, even at Calvary, when, we, when Jesus and this guy, other thief railing on Jesus, you know, he, and he didn't know better. He didn't know this was the son of God. He, he didn't know that. And just because he didn't know better, didn't mean that it wasn't a sin that he would have to deal with because Jesus said, forgive him because he needed forgiveness. But Jesus says, forgive him for he doesn't know what he's doing. He's ignorant, but he still needs forgiveness. He didn't need forgiveness because he was ignorant. Then Jesus wouldn't have to say that. Yeah, he don't know what he's talking about. Anyway. He don't know what he's doing. He don't know what he's saying. Jesus could have left him alone. But this sinner needed forgiveness and Jesus Christ was dying so he could transact that forgiveness. So just because you didn't know better, 
or just because this thing happened and you're weak and you're mortal and you're just clay and you're just dust doesn't mean anything. So it still comes back to um, there is a standard that God requires and we are to live holy in the church in the middle of Corinth. Yes, we understand you in Corinth and you're not in Macedonia. Yeah. And so now you get no, you still don't get a pass. It still has to be dealt with. God demands wholeness and he demands his church to live holy. And that wholeness is because you are saved. It's because you're, you're blood washed. And that's what Paul says in verse 11. So let's look at verse 11. Uh, and, and this is how, how Paul says that he's not telling you something you can't do. Or it's, it's not, it's impossible. He's not telling you to live in a way that's impossible to live, even if you are in Corinth. Even if you do have issues. Even if you were born with this thing where, you, where everyone in your family was something and now you got the same thing. Okay, fine. But something is greater than that. And, and Paul talks this in verse 11 on how, uh, as Pastor John did up last week, that that's the way you were. <laughs> you were. You used to be that way. You used, used to be just like that. But what happened? Someone read verse 11. For some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the spirit of our God. Okay, right. So, so now Paul says, but ye are washed. If something is washed, what does that mean? Cleaned. Clean. Pardon me? Cleaned. Clean, right, right, clean, right. And you do this at home. You always do something and you, and, and how, how do you tell sometimes whether something is washed or not? You ever seen something that you can't tell whether it's washed or not? Is this washed or it's clean? What do you do? Smell it. Smell it. Smell, yeah, I, I thought I was the only one to get there. Yeah, you smell it. <laughs> you can say, well, <laughs> it looks clean, but this doesn't smell right, right? Which means I'm going to go someplace, I'm going to say, what? You know, I can't get close enough to you because it stinks, okay? It, it smells. So you can walk around looking clean, but if it smells, you can't get close enough to anybody. So it's something when, when Paul says you are washed, that means you can get close enough to people now, and you're not going to repel people. And if I get close enough, why is it important for me to be close to people? In a spiritual sense. Why is it important for me to say I'm washed and, and, and people aren't going to repel me? I mean, what's, what's my end goal? Well, I'll ask you that question in a minute then. All right. Because you're uh, washed. Pardon me? Sir. Uh, the end goal is to um, bring in more souls to Christ. Yeah, exactly. Right. I get close enough to you to get you the gospel. I'm not, I'm not chasing you away. <laughs> you know, I'm, I, why do people keep running from me? I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to pass out a track. Well, people don't like people to pass out a track. Well, I'm just want to share them down. Well, okay, but they don't, I just can't get close enough to people. So we have to, we're, we're clean enough, but we get to people and people don't feel like, whoo, you, you know, you ever talk to somebody and you say, oh man, I'm glad this over. Oh man, I talk, whoo, jeez. I need to go take a shower. I mean, some people you talk to and you feel dirty when you get to be talking. I, I know I do. I have people like that that I could be on the phone with them and I feel like I got to go do something. Just about talking to them on the phone, like uh, <laughs> I was talking to, to this uh, 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 one friend and she was watching something on, uh, on Facebook or something like that. And I watched the video. It was, it was nice. I mean, it was video, but it was just a guy rambling about some stupid stuff. And she said, oh, I have to go sanitize my eyes after watching that video. <laughs> sanitize your eyes because i'm just i hate even watched it you know so it's like some things like that you get people and it's like i just i just don't like this experience but we're washed and we're clean and when we, we're having a change with people it, it actually feel good i mean they should feel good about talking to us about whatever we talked about they say yeah they want us around and and as we around these people and we're in that circle then it's our opportunity like you said to win souls and to share the gospel we can't really win souls if we can't reach them we can't talk to them they we can't have a relationship with them and, and um so when we think about how we are and and even in corinth yeah you got to reach these souls in corinth but the way you reach these souls in corinth is not being like them not being that reviler or drunk or a cover or a thief or abuser of themselves or fornicator or idolater and adulterer anything like that and they could just pick it right out but Paul starts a list off saying fornication. Okay, so this is what's the deal. That's what's really going on. Okay, yeah, but I thought he talked about that in chapter five. Yeah, he did. And looks like, like I've said, that's the shortest chapter in, in this whole book, the way it's broken out. Yeah, but he went through with it. So they could breathe a sigh of, sigh of relief that Paul talked about it and got it over with. But then he comes right back to it and it's the leader of the list because that's what it is. And what exactly, what exactly is it? 
I mean, in, in the Old Testament, uh, uh, there was a lot about idolaters. And that's a big, big saying, idolatry, 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 putting some God before them. And then you take fornication, you look at it the exact same way. I mean, you're supposed to have this, this, this love for God, and my whole body is for God's use. But then I replace it for something else. I say, no, I'm a, I, I got you right here, but this is more important for me. I just put something else in front of God. I just said this body's for something else. I'm, 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 I'm availing myself of something else, which is more important because I'm breaking your rule, breaking your law. But I'm going to do this. That is idolatry itself. So I, it looks like that this is also idolatry. You know, fornication is idolatry. Idolatry is fornication. It's the same thing. You're putting something else before God. And so this is getting down to what the real, you know, system is here, the, the systematic problem of all this is that what are you putting before God? Or, or are you living to please God or something else or somebody else like yourself? And if you are, then it's like idolatry, even if it's your own self, even if it's your job or your wealth or you're pursuing something in life, other than that, then you just put something else in God's place. And so now anything can happen. Anything can happen. Once you do that, then, you know, everything goes from there. And so when we get down to just looking at all these individual symptoms, um they are, they are just symptoms of, of, a, of a larger problem and so when we look at ourselves and we try to pick out what's wrong with me and why i keep doing this i'm trying to stop this i'm trying to stop that you can stop all of that each one on one by one or you get down to what <clears throat> what the real uh, uh what real problem is and that's what has to be the dealt with and and really and truly it comes down to you know this this devotion and and love for the Lord and wanting to please Him with everything you have and all that you are and just be His um, be His child, be His servant, uh, and to be used uh, exclusively you know by Him. And, and we go we do we do that to a certain degree sometimes in any area of our life. We we uh, I'm, I'm pay God first with my time. I'm, I'm you know acknowledge God first with everything else, and then the rest is for me. Well. Is it just that piece and then you go do what you want to do? Or is it, is it everything? And we should build everything, all of my resources, all my mental capacity, all of my physical capacity, everything that I have, my thoughts, I should avail them for God's use and, and for his purpose. And it's not like he's going to take them all and leave you nothing. And, you know, he's going to manage it right. <laughs> and, you, you, and, and it's to your good. And, and, and obviously, you know, again, for his glory. So in this case, uh, when, when you're around people who live for themselves, looking out for number one, it's easy to say, well, I just won't be that bad, but I'm going to be something like that. And that's really and truly a lot of what was going on here at the Church of Corinth. They saw themselves like that. But um, Paul says, but ye are washed. Yeah. But then he says, you are sanctified. Now, and but you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Now, look at the word uh, uh, sanctified there in verse 11. Uh, what does that mean? I got the definitions down at the bottom. What does that set mean? Aside. Right, right. Set aside, it's being uh, it's consecrated. It's mean this is you set aside for what though? His purpose, his use. His purpose is use. Okay, so you're washed but you are sanctified. That means God has put you aside for his use. And then he says, but you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the spirit of our God. Now, when Paul says you are sanctified, you know, I, I gotta, I gotta move for a second. Uh, hold on for a second. Uh, look at uh, sanctified. So when we look at sanctified, we set aside, we're set aside for, for God's use. Uh, so what does that mean then? For uh, when you say you set aside for God's use, what does that mean? What is it? What what's not supposed to happen then? I mean, who who, who dictates your day? Who dictates how you your twenty four hours and everything? Else? Or I can hardly hear. God dictates your day. Right. He right. So day. absolutely, he's, he's sanctified, and but we. Most of the time we say, hey, I'm saved, sanctified, Holy Ghost filled, running for my life. We say that, and it sounds good. But if we stop and think about it, then we're no longer our own. God took us and he set us aside for his purposes and for his use to be used by him. But we, we blow right through that. And uh, Paul, in his letter, using a particular word that Pastor Bobby did a series on, 
maybe over a year ago, but it was on Zoom. Mm -hmm. Remember, uh, you remember the series on Vault? Your Vault? Yeah. Okay, and that's that's interesting for us because most people don't want to. You know, everyone likes to like, I'm I'm it. I I call on shots. I'm the I'm the I'm the decider. I'm this kind of thing. But in this case, when you said you're sanctified, we gotta know that we've been bought and we've been set aside for God's use, period. And so I'm not my own, I'm not yours, uh, but I'm the Lord's and how do you use them? So when Paul says you're washed, you're clean now, and you are, you are sanctified. That means you've been set aside for God's use. And he says, you not on all that you are justified and justified in the Greek means to declare just to declare righteous. Not on that you, you are clean. You have, you like, uh, you wash something <laughs> special. Uh, you wash all these clothes. You wash all these silverware. You wash the china. You wash the china, and you set that china aside for a special occasion, and it's just perfect. And you set it there, and you're gonna pull it out sometime and use it. But nobody's to touch it. I think uh, Pastor Bobby gave an example about that before uh, a few weeks ago <laughs> about china things in their house. Uh, but you're set aside for use. But no one is to touch that until the person who owns it says now nah, i'm ready to pull this out and use it so this is paul saying you and he didn't say you were washed he said you are washed right now you're clean and he says you are sanctified and you are justified not you used to be but now you didn't waddle around with these corinthians he says you you are washed you're clean he said, you can't do this that's not who you are you are sanctified you're justified how in the name of the lord jesus and by the spirit of our god so it's things it's, it's like sometimes it's these reminders are just is all we really need to get back on track all we really need to find out i'm in the wrong place i'm on the wrong road i'm, I'm in the wrong you know zip code here all of a sudden you know how did i get here well i know i don't belong here because i'm something else uh is anybody here a kid um when you were a child uh your parents reminded you who you who you are who your last name was and all kind of stuff and you don't act like this, not my boy, not my girl. Anybody have it, ever had it happen? Yeah. Nobody? Nobody said, yeah. boy, you are Josh, you don't act like this. Anybody ever have that? Yes. Amen. <laughs> You're right. Okay. So you know how you pose act, because they say they, they have, have a standard. So in this case, Paul is saying, look, you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the spirit of our God. Now, I uh, was... Um, I was thinking this morning about this song that um uh you know back in the back in the in the late 70s uh uh you know, pastor bobby and uh John, jonathan davis's dad and, and i we were roommates in college and we had these we like these imperial the imperial song about imperials like in 79 88 there was some music and one of the songs they had had these words in it um and i have them here about how um this is one thing I thought about. So this this song, and look at question number four on the side. And uh, yeah, somebody read the first verse of that song and somebody read the second verse. All around there's hurry and confusion. The cares of life are pressing in. All through the day, they try to steal my faith with words that hurt and deeds that block my way. Ah, but that's when I remind myself whose child that I am. And inside me, there's strength to overcome. And then I speak his name and the tension breaks and his love flows as a song to my heart. Okay, it's a beautiful song. And uh, the name of the song, I think, is when I, when I speak his name. And it just tells you about like this child of God who's going through and it's getting rough and getting tough. I don't know what's really they want to do in response to it do they want to gravitate to something low or do they want to swing back or they want to just go ahead and give in to whatever it is but it's like just really a time of confusion uh, but they remind themselves whose child i am so it's like who whose child am i and you said wow and at that point something happens and what paul is doing here he's reminding them and such are some of you, but ye are washed, ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of my God. At that moment, when you feel like, well, I'm all blown here. Get up out of this dirt. Get out of this thing, you know, and, and, and move on. 
And so just that reminder may give you all the strength you need to know you don't belong in with these people. You don't belong in this little group. You know, um, I thought about this story. Y'all probably heard this story before about the, uh, and I, what I thought about earlier, I would have put it up here, but it was, uh, I heard a preacher tell it a long time ago, back in the 90s in New Jersey, about a, um, a eagle, an egg that was in a, that was hatched in a chicken coop or something like that. And some farmer had some eggs and put them all in, um, and found an egg and he put it in his chicken coop with the rest of his chickens and the egg hatched and looked just like a chicken. So it was brown there with chicken and it was just um, acting like a chicken. And after a while, you know, it had wings and feathers and things like that. And it realized it didn't have a taste for this corn that the chicken was eating. And it just didn't walk around much. It, it had wings and it just flew. And it got up on the top of the thing and then it realized that it didn't belong there. And it was an eagle. It was, I kind of, I didn't tell the story right, but the point was it was an eagle egg. And it realized I don't belong in this chicken coop. And it just took up and so and never returned back. But at some point, the eagle realized I look like a chicken when, and chicken, they do look like a chicken when they're born. It looks like a chicken, but but after a while, you know, realize I'm not a chicken, I'm an eagle. And so you might look like the people you're hanging around and you've been doing it for a long time, but at some point you can realize, hey, I don't belong here with you. I, I, I'm something else. I'm washed. I'm sanctified. I'm justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the spirit of our God. And I don't belong here with all this. And so that may be just enough to, to give you the strength to, to come out of it. And so we, we need to know not only who we are, but we have to know whose we are. And the second part uh, uh, of this uh, chapter, you know, Paul, well, Paul ends this by telling them whose they are. And right now you're just telling them who you are, you know? So let's start with that. You know who you are. And then who, who has the license to you? You know, who, who dictates everything you're doing? And, and how did that happen? So, what, when we decide and what am I going to do and how am I going to do it, this kind of stuff, just, just know who who's you are. You know, act, act like you're a, a tenant worker. Hey, boss, can I take off? Uh, can, yeah, you can take off. You have, you have 25 vacation days. Well, why don't you just take a vacation when you want to? Because I got to ask my boss, can I take it? I have my days. I'm supposed to take my days, but I can't just go do those days unless I ask my boss, can I take off? I request the time off. And that's the way it works. So now, what are you requesting to do? And because if you're yours and you, you can make the call yourself, well, you can just go do it. But if we're a child of God and he owns us, we're his, then I get down to verse 12. And Paul says, come on, read, come on, read verse 12. All things, that are, all things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expended. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Okay, so let's look at, um, Paul says, all things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. So that word in the Greek lawful means, plain what we know it, means lawful. It's okay to do. And expedient means, in the Greek, means an advantage or to be better for. So Paul said, look, uh, there's a lot of things you could do, but it's not to your advantage. There's a lot of things you can do legally. You're not breaking the law, but is that the best thing for you to do right now? Well, how do you really know? How, how do you know? How, how do you know what's when to do it? It's okay to do it. But now I say, well, the question is, should I do it? Or is it expedient? And when I ask the question, is it to my advantage to do it? Is it expedient to do it? How do I determine whether or not it is or not? I mean, I got to keep going to say, well, yeah. So how, how do you how do you measure some, whether something which is OK to do? Should it be done? Wisdom. OK, wisdom. And uh, you're exactly right on that one. Uh, wisdom and then but what's the, what's the result? What's the, what's the end result of the whole thing? Like, how do you know what it was like? Well, life experiences also. Okay. And then when you look back at it from it, and let's just take a life experience. When you look back at it, how would you know, like, this was, this was good? Oh, I shouldn't have done it anyway. 
but this was the right thing to do. God got the glory out of it. Yeah, if God get the glory out of it. Yeah, I tell, I, I'm not asking the question right, but I, I like all these answers because they all all fit exactly what, what I'm looking for. But I'm not asking the question correctly. But if I take all this and I look at uh, what what I what I experience in life and and um, and God's getting the glory out of it, and just the wisdom of knowing all of these things. Um, at, at some point, I can say, "Look, I'm looking at something now, and I'm about to do this." And I can look back at it and say, "What exactly occurred? I mean, what 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 exactly ha ha what exactly occurred that that God would look at it and say this was God would be pleased? Did God smile at the end of the day of this, or did I just smile and I was just happy because I got it off my chest? <laughs> it was okay, and I felt better. I mean, so if it made me feel better, chances are just me feeling better all by myself." Chance that wasn't the right thing. But if I'm feeling good because I'm, I believe that God is smiling, I think God, I think God is pleased with that. Then yes, it was expedient to do. So when we look at it, we can't really tell all the time going in. But if we stop and say, you know, it's, it's okay to do, yeah, I can do this. And is it is it is it to my advantage or is it to the advantage? My advantage or to God's advantage? Yeah, I, I could see. Oh yeah, I could, you know, come to think about, I can't see how God would benefit from this. <laughs> after you figured how you would benefit from it yeah well that's probably wrong but i'm doing this it's right that there's a thing to do and it would be advancing the kingdom it would be uh, i think god would be pleased with this i think this would make god smile what about you well i wouldn't i, I mean i'd probably be okay you know like well before we started sunday school this morning uh, uh i think it was julian and uh sister fanny were talking and uh, she was talking about some things she did with taking their families into her house and feeding them and stuff like that. Not for money, not for anything, just doing out of the goodness of her heart. Well, I think God would be pleased with that. Wouldn't he? God would smile at that. And how did she feel about it? Well, she probably was the only way she'd be happy because God was happy. But she didn't have, it was her food, it was her money, it was her time, it was her utilities, all, all being consumed by somebody with nothing in return back to her tangibly, but was it the right thing to do? Well, yeah, because it advanced God's kingdom. It, it, now she could reach them with the gospel. Now she could have, she could, they have a right to listen to her, <laughs> you know, now. So she put herself in that position. So when we look at it, is it expedient to do? Is God happy? Is God pleased? Yes, and how does it position me now to reach them with the gospel? If it positioned me to reach them with the gospel, then this was expedient to do. And not just say, now we're friends now. Now they like me. Now I can be part of the group. Unless y'all like me and be part of the group, now y'all can invite me to something. So now I can make sure I, I get the gospel to you when that time is right. Now I just give you a track and walk away. I don't know whether I got you to give you the gospel or not. I want you to receive the gospel. I, I want you to be receptive when I'm talking to you. And you, sometimes you have to earn that right to do that with people. And so when I'm looking at, is it law for me to do this? Yeah, it's okay. I'm not breaking any laws. Is it the time to do it? Well, maybe it's not the time to do it. But now it is because now it's expedient now because if I do it now, I'm advancing the kingdom. And, and so many times what we see like in, in the church of Corinth, they say it's no, it's nothing wrong. It's, it's, not a, it's not breaking the law. So they would do it. Like if you uh, do some things in Oklahoma City right now, um, you're breaking the law. Yeah, you are. Yeah, but you get on a plane three hours later, you're in Las Vegas. No, oh, you can do the exact same thing. And you know what? You're not breaking the law. And we had their churches in Las Vegas. So they could do a whole lot of things and not break the law. But is it expedient? No, not only is it expedient, it's breaking God's law. Something just breaking God's law. So we can stop short of, you know, even if, if, if there's nothing wrong with God's law, you're not breaking God's law. Still ask your question, is it, is it expedient? You know, how you spend your time, how you spend anything. Uh, how you spend your money, you know, how you do it. It's, 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 it's to whatever pleases God, because you, at, at the end, it's like I said, you, you're a ball. And so Paul is really uh, talking to the church, the church who is saved, the church who is justified, the church who is sanctified on how to live. Because you, it's not like you just get a, a free pass to live how you want to once you're saved. You live holy. That's something that my dad just 
preach all the time. I said, if you preach one message, live holy. He was serious about living holy. Not because so you'll be saved. Living holy because you're saved. And Paul says, all these won't inherit the kingdom of God. So you want to be saved. You want to live holy. You know, that's it. Um, and then Paul says in verse 12, uh, okay, any, any questions or comments about those, the first one thing I just talked about? I'm going to take a break here. Make sure you get any comments. Pastor, I should be going to the last clause in 12 now. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Yeah, but, but I, okay, yeah, okay. Okay, so Paul says, I could do all these things. None of these are expedient for me. All things are lawful for me. I could do a whole lot of stuff. But I will not be brought under the power of any. So what Paul is saying is that, look, I, I could do these things, but, you know, I, I could pick this thing up. I could put this thing down. That's not, that's not it. But some things you may pick up and you can't let it go. You, you can't let it go. And, and, and now, so, so who owns who at this point? Who, who owns whom at this point? Paul says, I would not be brought under power for anything. There's nothing that I could do in this life. I know it's, it's not a sin. I know it's... Um, there's it, nothing wrong with what I'm doing from God's standpoint or from man's standpoint. This is, but I would not be brought under the power of any that I'm doing. And that's people talk about like uh, addictions or habits, something like that. It's not always something illegal or something really detrimental to your physical and mental health, but it can be detrimental to your spiritual health. And no one knows why it's no one knows why it's it's eroding. Um, there's some erosion going on spiritually. But Paul says, "I will not be brought into the power of any, because I, only one person has the power of me, and that's the Lord. And so none of these things can actually control me." Uh, but that's, okay, well, turn you about to say something on that. I guess I always think of that clause of, uh, in in the way of buying things that you can buy things and they end up controlling you. You can buy a house, and then mm. house is so big, you have to spend so much time cleaning it that you don't mm. have time to do spiritual things. Or you can buy a car, mm. and you spend some time working on it, or cleaning, it or preparing, it or doing things. And how it's so easy to happen that you that you don't even realize it sometimes that something's controlling you. Oh my goodness, that is that is a, <laughs> that, is, that is an excellent point. That is an excellent point. That is an excellent point, and I think. Uh, and I and I know I've heard, I've heard so many, I've seen so many cases, heard so many cases, and experienced them personally the the exact same way, where if like I know like when I had a, my first car, you know I I had the car, but I ended up loving that car. That car ended up being totaled out, but man, that car was the car. It was nice, and it, at one point, I had a car, and it was just transportation. I drove the car. People get in the car. Fine. You want to ride? Get in the car. Oh, fine. Oh, my car got wet. Somebody got dirt. That was fine. Um, but when I got this other car, this is Blue Monte Carlo. Oh, boy. Man. You can't just anybody get in here. You know, I'm going to go in a place like that. You can't get water and stuff. And I spent so much time washing that car and watching that car. <laughs> it's like unbelievable. And there's well, nothing wrong with washing your car and watching your car. But I would wash it all the time. I wax it all the time. That's what I, I would do. And that car became more than a car. It became the, the thing. It was actually controlling me. And I knew that. And, and, but that could be anything. That could be our job. Oh, I got to do this. I can do this. And last night I'm thinking, oh, let me send this thing out about the job. I was going to send this stuff out. And I've been, I said, I'm not doing that. You know, I'm not doing that. If I got some extra time on the weekend, I'm going to do something else. I'm not doing that. And I didn't have to do it, but I just felt like I just wanted to do it. So how do you control that? I mean, you got to put things in, in its right box, in the right, right place, because it could easily turn into idolatry at that point. And I know that when we get houses, we do the same thing, like, oh, no, oh, don't put this, don't put this, that. And we could be too concerned about things here. But when, when we become so concerned about things that God has blessed us with, <laughs> we went after and God has blessed us with. And I'm not saying that all these that God has blessed us with. I'm just saying that almost, you know, sarcastically here. When we say this is a blessing, I'm God, and God does bless us with a lot of things, and then we can take those things and put them in the wrong place, and they become, you know, idols. They really do. They become idols because you put them in the place of God. I can't go to church right now because I got to clean this house. I can't go to church right now because you know, it's but my, my car get dirty. I can do this, you know, different things like that. Or you could pick people up in the in your car, 
to go to church. I remember cases like this, but now I got this new car. I can't be taking all these people in my car like this. Yeah, I can't do that. I can tell this car, you know, that kind of thing. And and I've seen cases like that. So uh, it, 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 if, if we're bought and we are bought, then everything we have is bought too. We don't have, we don't have we don't have anything. It's provided by that same person. And so if if I'm to be used for His glory, everything I have has to be used for His glory too. I have to veil all of that too for His glory. And so that's uh that's an extra point. And I think we need to all look at this because when we look at we skip over things like this and we say, "No, you not that." no idolaters we skip over that because i am not an idolater none of us are idolaters i don't have no little mini gods hanging up in my i bow down to and all that kind of stuff and on my little shelf and every place like that i don't have that yeah i don't but i have something that i put in the place of god they have something that i say yeah i'm gonna do this but this comes first once i get this done i'm gonna do that you know i did uh when i bought a bought a new car when i bought my new car back in two years ago I've never, <laughs> I never, I go years without washing my car. I don't care. I just go, I mean, I, I could go a whole year without washing my car. And I, I've done that without actually going to the car wash. But I bought this car and I thought, man, I like this car. And I went out and bought a membership to wash my car, a monthly membership. And I, and I did it for a month. I say, are you serious? You bought a membership to wash your car? Like you're going to go wash your car like every day? Yeah, because I'm going to get my money's worth. You know that? And I was going up there like every day to wash my car. I mean, literally, maybe I miss a day, but I was going four and five times a week to wash my car to, to get my money's worth. And I felt so convicted. I'm thinking, why are you spend this much time driving up to wash your car, drying it off, doing this kind of stuff, and then going back? What, are, what were you doing with that time before you got the car? <laughs> so, okay, I'm done with that. Never doing that again. So I canceled that thing because that thing was turning into something else. It was an idol. It was very well on the way because I was trading in some time that, that I used to do for something else. And now I'm spending time washing a car that don't really need to be washed. I was turning this car into an idol. Kind of to your point, Sherman. I was turning to it and did not realize it until I was thinking, why am I doing this? And I didn't think about it to the day I was going to do something else. But I didn't have time to do it because I was going to go wash the car because I was getting my money's worth. And I thought, wait a minute, this, this car, yeah, not, something just happened here that I didn't see happening. You know, and so I had to stop it. So I, I called him and said, cancel it and do it right now. And he said, well, we'll prorate, prorate it right now. And I'm done. And that was it. Never to be visited again. Unnecessary, but just to check it. So if you're doing anything that you would see, you spend an inordinate amount of time of doing something. And it's not something that's wrong. It's not illegal. Everyone does it. But does, is it expedient? Does it advance the kingdom? Does it advance your mission here? That's when you check it in. So it just all comes back down to one thing. Okay, you're, you're God's. You are the Lord. You are here for his glory, period. And what are we doing? And we can still enjoy life. But where does it stop? Like, like even right now, I'm, at, I'm, in, I'm in Orlando. Uh, and I, my, my plane, I was, I was driving, uh, I was in um, work this week, Monday, and boss said, hey, I need you to go to Tampa, you need to go to Jacksonville, you got to go here and go, go over there, and I got to go up to Remington, Georgia. So I was driving all over. I got up 3 o'clock in the morning, drove to Jacksonville, then left there in the early morning, drove to Tampa, then went back to Jacksonville, then I was supposed to go to Remington, Georgia, and I was tired. They said, now you can go back home. I said, I haven't gone home, go to Orlando. I'm going to go, go to Orlando. I'm going to go to Disney World. That's what I went. I drove Friday. So I'm going to Disney World, just hang out for a minute. I forgot it was spring break. And I got here and I said, all this spring, I said, I ain't going nowhere. But I was like, fine doing it. Because I was saying, I'm due for some fun. <laughs> I'm tired. And it was just too many people. So I didn't go, couldn't go to Disney World because there's a million people. <laughs> so I said, I'm not going there. So uh, I'm thinking, like, what am I going to do? But so now I'm saying, well, you know, and then uh, I know I'm supposed to do this. So I don't have a problem doing this. And that's why I hear music in the background because I'm here for God's glory. And if I was going to this world today, I wouldn't be <laughs> because I'm supposed to be doing this because I don't have time for it. But so it's like, but that's okay to do. There's nothing wrong with going to Disney World. There's nothing wrong going to have fun. But if you're supposed to be doing something else for God's glory, then you better make sure you're doing that because I mean, all this is a gift from God. So I think all of us need to put everything we have that God has given us to enjoy in its proper place, period. And once in the proper place, yeah, you, you'd be good. And so we are washed. 
we are sanctified. We've been set aside. We've been, we are justified. We've been declared righteous. And understand, being declared righteous is, is huge because no one declares anybody righteous. We've talked about this before. When you go to, someone goes to court, they may declare them innocent. I mean, not guilty, but no one's declared innocent. <laughs> we don't know whether you did or not. We just can't, we're just not sure you did it or not. So we're going to say you're not guilty, but we're not saying you're innocent, but you are not guilty. Okay. Well, here, when God justifies, we're declared righteous. We're declared innocent, but no one does that. No one does that. But we're declared right. He, we're justified by faith, period. And that's through God. So we're in a great state to be in. So now how do we live in this state? He's cleaned us. He justified us. He set us aside for his purposes. Oh, man, we're ready to roll. Yeah, we're ready to do what he orders us to do, what he has given and purposed us to do. That's what we're supposed to live. So we don't live for ourselves. We don't live to make Daryl happy. What make what would make Daryl happy right now? Well, put that aside for a second. What would make God happy right now? And sometimes what would make what God happy, same thing. Well, I kind of like this too. I would love that. You know, oh, great. But that's not the deciding factor. It's what pleases God. So Paul says, you know, all things are lawful, but I would not be brought under the power of many, though those things uh, are not controlling me, even the things I would like doing, that's legal, and that's lawful, because now they're, they're controlling me. I'm be still being controlled by the Lord on what he wants me to do, and that's me, that's my mind, that's my body. Paul keeps going back to the body, because that, that flesh knows it's not going to be saved, flesh knows it's not going to be saved so flesh is trying to get all it can right now do it to satisfy it now because it's not going to be saved the flesh is not going to be saved and it's warring against the spirit who is going to be saved flesh knows it so the flesh is never planning on sitting down and say go ahead and do what you want to do it always going to want to be pleased it always wants to be satisfied it always wants to be pleasure that's the way it's going to be as long as we live it and is going to push down with low pay still illegal to do yeah but it's not expedient we got to do the things that god has called the purpose to do in his life period and so this church at corinth was getting this lesson from paul because it was just morphing to the environment along a lot of fronts and um he gets down to that all right uh that's um uh let's see so that's about about as far as uh, i want to go today um, I had verses 13, 14 on here, and it kind of gets down to it as well. It gets back down to uh, an example of what Paul was saying, and we'll just say that for, for next time. But any other questions, comments, or interjections from anyone uh, about some of the things we talked about here today? I, th I think the, the bottom line is that we're not, we're not our own. We belong to God. Our bodies belong to God. And we are to um, live according to his plan for us because he's, he's, he's set us up for that. He's washed us, he cleanses, he justifies for his purpose and for his use. So we need to be living like we are to be used by him. Simple. All right, I'm going uh, to turn it back over to uh, Pastor John and Pastor Bobby. Any best words for Wonderful. Man. Wonderful teaching. I don't know if Pastor John is still on or not, if he had anything he wanted to add. Yeah, Deandre said he's not available. Okay. okay. I just thought it was a real great lesson, real practical lesson. Uh, it's amazing. Look at the, the degree of things which these saints were involved with, and yet Paul still treating the saints. And teach us not to judge. You know, we don't wear, know where people are coming from, what they're dealing with. And uh, just because you're not dealing with that thing or would never do that thing or never be caught up in that, you look at this list, you go, wow, is he talking to church people? And uh, it's uh, really um, an amazing uh, section of scripture. And we think about the things that people get caught up in today, and yet God still loves them and still calling for them and still reminding them through his uh, ministers and people he puts around them that you're still a child of God. God, you're washed, you're justified, you, you know, you, you've been called from this. And uh, as Pastor was teaching, you got to live now in a way that glorifies God. And I just love the idea of this father who just keeps pulling at you and, and keeps holding on to you and keeps giving you a chance 
Um, thank you, Jesus. This keeps giving you a chance. Thank you. For um, you know, despite your failures and despite, you know, when you look back, um, I guess the interesting thing about the uh, Old Testament when Pastor John was teaching on the book of Leviticus and uh, they came up with all these sacrificial systems. Um, some of those things, uh, some of those sacrifices were offered for intentional sins where you just kind of, I'm just going to go do this. And you got angry or mad or responded some way. You intentionally went and did something. Later, you came and says, oh, God, I can't believe I did that. I can't believe I said that. I can't believe I fell in that way. So even intentional sins were, were I mean, um, it's just amazing the love of God and his pull towards you. And he, um, as Pastor was teaching morning, reminds you, hey, do not carry on like this. All things are lawful, but everything's not good for you. Everything's not going to be convenient. You got to live expedient. You got to live in a way that glorifies God now. Uh, it's just um, a, um, it's, it's just, it's just so to me, this chapter, even though it's talking about sin, shows the love of God because these were his kids that were involved in, in this level of sin. And yet here he is admonishing them and pulling them and telling them, hey, you washed, you sanctified, you're mine. The spirit that raised of Christ Jesus uh, dwells in you. It's going to raise you up from the dead. And despite all the dirt that you allowed yourself to get in, and as Pastor Dale said, not to wallow in it, get up from there, child of God. And, and, and be what God wants you to be and do what God has called you to do. It's a very uh, graphic chapter. Uh, it's a very encouraging chapter because I see the hand and love of God. And I appreciate you, Pastor Dale, for bringing those aspects of the, of the lesson out. Uh, very, very well done. God bless you. And thank y'all so much. Um, this time I'm going to ask uh, Brother Julian to do our closing prayer. Good morning, Saints. Are there any um, prayer requests? I'm going to continue to ask um, y'all to pray for my dad. We had a little incident. We had to go up and uh, see him on yesterday. So please continue to keep him in prayer. Amen. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Uh, sure, uh, <laughs> Minister Harper, um, she has another procedure on tomorrow morning, um, just remember her in prayer. Amen. Amen. I want to request prayer for my oldest sister, Linda. I've been, um, when she walks, she walks bent over. And uh, I just recently talked to her and going to a chiropractor and then he told her she needed to get a knee fix and so forth. And I've never remembered my sister being anything other than kind of down and discouraged her whole life. And so I just want God to just do something, help her in some type of way. To encourage her to live and help herself and not to be so sad and depressed all the time. Just whatever God does, y'all pray for it. Amen. You said your sister's name is Linda. what again? Linda. Linda. Okay. Any, uh, any other requests? I pray for the, those dealing with mental illness. Amen. Okay. Also, please remember my brother and his family, William Robinson and his family. Are there any others? Any unspoken? Right. Let us go before the throne. Oh, Father God, I thank you uh, that you are so merciful, so kind, so loving, God. Thank you that, that you dwell among us, even in the midst of our mess, Father. I thank you for your sacrifice that enables a relationship with you, your blood that was spilled out, torment that you endured, Father, just to 
save a race of beings, God, that you easily could have created all over again and started a new God. Thank you so much for your love, God. I ask your blessings uh, over the church, Father. Help us to continue walking, doing in your will, Father. Thank you, God. And um, I'm going to ask your blessings for my grandpa, Bill. God, bless it and touch his mind, Father, with what his mental and what issues he's going through, Father. Please calm his spirit, Father, and help him be in constant communion with you, God. Help him to trust the people that he's supposed to trust that are around him, God. And uh, help them to continue living strong and healthy. Ask your blessings for Minister Harper and her operation. Be there in the operating room with her father. Um, watch over the doctor's hands, God. Guide them, Father. Increase her health and strength, Jesus. Um, help her health to, you know, keep on being renewed. Keep on strengthening her. Keep on running her race, God. Help her continue. Give them the glory for what you have continued to bring her through. Um, I ask your um, mercy and grace on earth to Sister Linda, Father. I ask you to touch her physical nature, God, her stature, God, her spine, her legs, her femurs, God, and her walk. Touch your hip bones, Jesus. Align them the way you designed them to work. Thank you. And I ask you, God, that you uh, touch your heart and touch your mind, Jesus. Help her to place her full trust in you, Jesus. Help to know that you hold everything in your hand, God, and everything obeys you, Father. Everything heeds your voice, and everything listens to your whim, Father. I ask you to um, bless and strengthen her, Father, and to keep the guards of her mind up, God, and keep her spirit reined in. I ask um, for... Um, Mental strength all around, Father, for those who are dealing with mental health issues, Jesus, I ask that you would um, flesh out the pathways of their mind, Father. I ask you to uh, guard where their mind goes, where their eyes goes, Father. Help them to take in good things, God. Help them to think on virtuous things, things that are true, things that are honest, things that are pure, things that are praiseworthy, Father. Help them think and dwell on these things that you might dwell with them, God. Um, and I ask you also to uh, be with my Uncle William, God, and his family in their grieving process, Jesus. God, you said you are, your words said you were close uh, to the brokenhearted, Father. God, be with them, God. Help them to feel your presence, God. Help them to feel your arms wrapped around them, God, over their mind, over their daily walk, over their hearts, over their emotions and their feelings, God. Console them and be a comfort to them, Father, as you have promised and as you are constantly doing, God. Even when we don't see it, you are always working, God, behind the scenes, in front of the scenes. When we can't see it, even when we don't feel it, God, you are right there continually working on us, God, and in and out of our situations. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Thank you, Father, for all that you have done, all you continue to do. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. Amen. For all that you have brought us through. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord, everyone. I'd like to thank... Uh, Thank God for the word uh, brought forth uh, through Daryl. Let's, let's remember to keep it in our hearts this week, study it, uh, and remember each other in our prayers uh, after this, uh, as we go through our daily uh, task and, and work. There's so much need in the world right now, especially overseas and, and here as well. Uh, continue to support us, continue to pray for us. The, the given opportunity is on the screen. Uh, every man according as he purposed in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity. God loveth a cheerful giver. Uh, if you need to contact us via uh, phone, con uh, contact us at 405-778-4949. And you can text also uh, that if you have any questions about anything, if you need to speak to a minister, uh, just please contact us, 405-778-4949.
And thank you. And uh, remember to join us on Facebook, 